We have le about 10 minutes left, so I'd like to take a few questions from the uh, audience um, and the participants. Um, so if you can ask questions in Q&A or in chat or uh, raise your hand and you know we will try to come to you uh, hopefully if we, if we have time. So the first question by uh, Bill Lawrence. Does Ranushi recognize the degree to which his thought is somewhat context specific to Tunisia or North Africa or the Arab world, perhaps? Uh, or does he see his thought as applicable um, in every in very different Muslim and non-Muslim contexts? Uh, does he see his contributions as in dialogue and evolving, or does he see them more as standing and transposable to other contexts and other countries? So that's the uh, first question. We'll take three questions together. Uh, Farid Hafiz asks, to what extent do you think uh, is Ghanoushi's thought a way of doing pragmatic politics and in one way rooted in Islamism's preoccupation with the nation state? Uh, is there any hint to more anarchist or fundamental epistemological critiques of the nation state itself? Um, okay, Jocelyn Cesari, uh, it's not a question, but she, she says there is a difference between Muslim and Islamic democracy. And I think you alluded to that, uh, uh, Andrew, in your presentation, and you, you explained the difference bet between the two. Um, Mustafa Mas'ud asks, I want to raise a question about the concept of sovereignty in current debate as well. It still carries the theological connotation of monopoly, of coercion, and absolute authority. Does that not go well? That does not go well with democracy and liberalism. How does Ranushi deal with this issue? Okay, so can you answer very quickly, Andrew? This uh, yeah, two, three <coughs> questions. All and we'll fantastic take another and very round. theoretically rich questions. First, to Bill's question, <coughs> the short answer is both. So, uh, and Monica referred to this as well. There's a lot of discussion of uh, El Khususiyah et Tunisia, right? The Tunisian particularity and the Tunisian reform tradition and the Tunisian constitution of 1861. And this is only for us. On the other hand, uh, uh, um, Renouchi, for a long time, was an international public intellectual, <clears throat> visited many, many Islamic countries. <clears throat> um, and uh, there's lots of interesting a uh, discussion of uh, uh, the applicability of Muslim democracy in Malaysia and Indonesia and Turkey. And so I think both iterations of his work, uh, the Islamic democratic iteration in public freedoms in the Islamic state, it's not public freedoms in post borghibist Tunisia. They're very abstract uh, discussions. And Tunisia is put in that context. The end of that book he surveys all these different contexts and Tunisia is analyzed as one of them. So the answer is both. He, he obviously recognizes the legitimacy of a particular Tunisian tradition, but he's speaking to the to the wider Islamic international public sphere. Um, Farid's question is really, really smart. If you read public freedoms in the Islamic state, and this is why I alluded earlier to loving this book as a political theorist and teaching it in class, he has a he the whole book is framed around a critique of Western democracy. <clears throat> Western democracy has a bunch of great mechanisms, tools, devices, love them, <clears throat> but its foundation is unacceptable. <clears throat> and that's precisely what you call an epistemological critique of the nation state. He says that modern Western democracy is built on the idea of the rule of law <clears throat> and the sovereignty of the people, but there's no moral foundation there. It can do whatever it wants, uh, bomb Vietnam, destroy the environment, et cetera, et cetera. And so the idea that um, modern democracy does not have a moral foundation is an epistemological critique that is the framing of his entire book. And then the answer is, why would Islamic democracy be any better? And the entire book, I would argue, Public Freedoms in the Islamic State, is how could an Islamic democracy uh, borrow many of the, of the institutions of modern democracy, but provide it 
with a moral foundation and set of practices <coughs> that avoids the moral uh, pitfalls and paradoxes of the modern state. <coughs> um, so uh, so that, that's the answer to that question. The later work <coughs> is less so of a critique of the modern state because it's a response to having to do politics within the nation state. And then uh, uh, Professor uh, Masood's question, uh, which I'm delighted to receive. He's uh, been one of my intellectual idols for a long time. Um, uh, that question about sovereignty is precisely the argument of my interpretation of this book. So if, you, if you'll let me very quickly uh, just go back to the um, sharing screen. I'm going to be very brief, Radwan. Okay, um, very, very brief. You'll see here that one of my arguments is that um, is that Muslim democracy should be seen as post-sovereigntist. It doesn't begin with the idea that you're identifying the single sovereign agent, whether it's God or the people or some combination that then uh, speaks in a in a single voice to be able to declare what is legitimate. It begins with the messy fact that the demos or the people in a democracy is not morally unified, doesn't speak with a single voice, um, doesn't have a single sovereign agency. And then how do you think about politics uh, with that reality? So I'm very sympathetic to that question. And in my view, the entire shift from Islamic democracy to Muslim democracy is about getting away from this obsession with sovereignty. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we'll take three quick uh, questions. Um, first, there is a comment, but I think it's important to, to read it. Uh, Dr. Noor Hayati Ali Asigaf, we have been, we have heard a lot about how great Ghanoushi uh, is, and I witnessed how great he is. It will be, it will be great if this great people think about how to get this honorable uh, uh, thinker Ghanoushi out from jail. Can we do? Can we put our effort and network together to free him uh, as our appreciation for uh, this great man? I think that's a call for all of us, really, to to do what we can to you know put pressure uh, on the Tunisian regime on Qais Saied uh, to release him. Um, you know because he is, of course, old. Uh, his his health. I heard is, is deteriorating uh, in jail. He's already been in jail for over or close to a year. And uh, so we need to really uh, uh, work together to put pressure on on the, on Qais uh, Saeed to release him uh, from jail as soon as possible. Um, so Jocelyn Cesari asks, Ghanoushi is a religious person. So from a religious perspective, the difference between theory and practice or political practice is not positive. Do we know how he himself sees this divide, you know, between theory and, and practice? And the last but not least, uh, Julius Distelhoff asks, thank you very much for your important book, the event and contributions. How would you explain the current relationship between political practice and political thought within Nahda? My observation indicates that since Saeed mon monopolization of power and the structural containment of another, there has been a focus on political thought, you know, meta discussions, rather than concrete political measures for Tunisia aimed at shaping the current social, political, social, political, and religious structures. So, uh, again, it's about the dichotomy between, you know, thought and practice and um, what can another do or what can Ranushi do now to restore democracy. So again, very quickly, and then we're, we're going to take a few concluding remarks from the, the discussants and hopefully end within a few minutes. Go ahead, Andrew. I'd like to say something about Jocelyne's question and then leave the second question to Radwan and Monica. Uh, I'm not sure I understand precisely what she means by saying the difference between theory and political practice is not positive. I don't, I'm not sure I understand that, but I will say that... Um, in, in an Islamic context, that distinction <clears throat> is very complicated. So Islam is a worldly religion. <clears throat> and so the obligation to take care of the world, <clears throat> to see to the maslaha 
of people is a religious obligation, but also a practical one. So as you all know, there are many ways of discussing this disagreement. There are things that are permanently true, issues of creed and theology, morality, virtue, and there are things that are contingent or there are things that are subject to um, a political reality or to judgment. Uh, and so, you know, there's there's many, many ways that uh, Islamic political language has for talking about things that are um, uh, are non-negotiable or permanently true and things that are guided by things that are permanently true, but are constantly subject to contingency, circumstance, judgment. And that's, of course, true for um, Islamic law as well. There's the distinction between matters of worship and matters of social practice, <clears throat> and even the idea that some matters of social practice might be uh, subject to change uh, based on what is um, beneficial to the people or not. So um, the idea that there's here's religious things and here's not religious things is not something I think that he would necessarily uh, begin by by saying. Thank you. Um, concluding remarks um, to the discussants. Uh, any final final uh, comments or or uh, we'll start with uh, Mustafa, then Monica and, and Radwan. There was a question, what was Erdogan's and his party's view of Ghanoushi's thinking, uh, which can help me say a few more things. I mean, there's respect for Ghanoushi, I think, in Turkey, in all the Islamic circles. But I've heard after the beginning of the coup process in Tunisia and ultimately the jailing of Rashid Ghanoushi, some of Erdogan's hardline supporters wrote that. Uh, you see, you need a tough guy like Erdogan. Ganushi was too soft, too nice, and you see what they did to him, sort of thing. Um, which, and I said on top of that, well, so are you proud that you've not been the oppressed, but the, the oppressors, I mean, you ended up, and, and the issue is, how do we actually end a zero-sum game in these societies where there are people who have the upper hand and others somehow end up in jail? In Turkey, Turkey's Islamic movement, actually, if you ask me, was unlucky because it had a it didn't have a figure like Ganushi. And that's why it began without much theoretical thinking on these issues, very pragmatically, very moderate, but ended up very Machiavellian and authoritarian. Uh, and one more lesson from Turkey is that the belief in the people should be uh, tamed a little bit. Uh, the people may love authoritarian leaders, as we see in the West too. Uh, and it's important, I think uh, the last point that Sheikh Rashid Ghanushi said, uh, the consensus among the elites, which should ultimately produce a, what I would call a liberal political framework of government limits and a doctrine of rights that should be the foundation of the state and should be guarded by a judiciary. I think that's very crucial in, uh, in building democracies as, as a foundation. Uh, and the Sharia may be a, may be conforming to that. Sharia might be an expression of that. But I think this emphasis on a bigger universal value, uh, natural law, justice. These I think philosophies are important to introduce. And one one reason I find Sheikh Ganeshi's work very valuable is he's also engaging in these discussions. Thank you, uh, Monica. Yeah, I'll respond to two of the questions. On the question of where Anatha's thought currently stands, I think we have to un to recognize that Anatha is in a real state of persecution and, and disarray at the moment. Um, the last time I was inside the Anatha headquarters was last year, about a year ago, before it was shut down. Um, Kaya Syed, a uh, little under a year ago, shut down all of their party offices along with other parties that he views as, as uh, threatening. Um, and I was talking with Abdul Karim Haruni, the head of the, the Shorter Council, inside the office, and the windows were drawn, the blinds were down, the lighting was very dim. We were like basically the only people there. There might have been a couple of assistants. And on every level... And, and you know you know that uh, Haruni is also in jail now. That's right. That's right. And And I was talking with him, and every Anatha leader I interviewed in those weeks, are you afraid of being put in prison? And of course, that was a very imminent threat. And within weeks, they were put in prison. Um, and on every level, it just felt like the lights were going out. The lights were going out on Tunisian democracy. The lights were going out on Anatha's internal 
organizational structures and conversations uh, for the time being. So I think there's there's reconstitution work going on right now. Radwan, you would know more about that than I do. But, you know, in the darkest days of the Ben Ali period, there was a divide between Anahta Fidechel and Anahta Fikharish. And Anahta in the outside world continued to meet and reflect and produce reports on what they got right and got wrong. And that really helped keep the movement alive in the dark days. And I'm hoping that we're Work is going on like that now or that planning for work is going on like that but it's just it's a nightmare right now and the level of harassment that Anatta families and even their lawyers some of their lawyers are in prison too are being subjected to and repression across the ideological spectrum is is really absolutely terrible um I also, like Mustafa, wanted to briefly respond to Celine's question about the, the Turkey comparison with AKP, because I think it's really illustrative of how Anatha sits within a comparative and regional context. I've spent most of my adult life physically and intellectually between T Tunisia and Turkey. So I've been obsessed with this question for a long time, for well over a decade. And I... I wrote an article in the Journal of Democracy a few years ago called something like Tunisia's Islamist and the Turkish model. That's all about my interviews with AK Party people about what they thought about Anatha and vice versa. And I've kind of been on personal jihad since about 2015 um, to try to get them to learn from each other, to try to get Tunisia's Anatha to learn what not to do from Turkey's democratic backsliding and Erdogan and AKP's role in that. And to try to get AKP to look at Anatha in Tunisia as something more than a cute little wannabe AK party cousin, <laughs> which is how it's tended to view it. Um, I completely agree with what Mustafa said. Um, and, and just to put another layer of detail on that, in my interviews with AK party folks as early as 2015 and 2016 about how they viewed Anatha and how they view Hanushi in Turkey, they would say, we have a raiz we have this strong president, this real tough guy. They have a hoja. They've got a teacher in Tunisia. And Hanushi, he's this cute little teddy bear-like hoja. But if you really, really want to run the country and you really want to be the model, you don't need a teacher. You don't need a hoja. You need a reis. And the way that women would talk in Ak party about simply seeing Erdogan, catching a glimpse of him, shaking his hand. It was as if they were they were rhapsodizing about a, a charismatic cult figure. And I never, not once, heard anybody in Anatha speak that way about Hanushi. I mean, in part because Hanushi is just not a charismatic bully like Erdogan is, um, nor does he have Erdogan's illiberal populist instincts. I mean, young people in Anatha didn't even enjoy reading his books <laughs> a lot, like, we, like Andrew and I were just discussing, for better and worse. Um, so I don't think Hanushi ever had that in him. But one thing that that did um, concern me over the years is that I didn't hear enough concern from Hanushi and from other figures in Anatha about Turkey's democratic backsliding. I think AK Party, irregardless of that right East charismatic bully dictatorial model that they increasingly fell into, um, remained a model for for Anatha. And I think. He has um, told me things in yeah. private, critical of Erdogan. Yes. That, he's no longer interested in any democratizing project or no longer really even an Islamic figure. It's only about power and authority for himself. So, And I've heard some similar things. I think it took too long, but but there there was that concern. Um, but but I still haven't heard inside the, the folks in Ak Party who stayed a learning from Kanushi or a learning from Anatha. There's a lot of AK Party folks who left, more liberals and more intellectuals in AK Party who are now on the outside who who understand that lesson and who will have a very interesting dialogue with you about that. Radwan, closing remarks in uh, under one minute, please. Y yes, I will try. I think I need more. Uh, <laughs> and, and question right. of the uh, theory and practice. That's really important. And... Uh, I will be critical here to Rashid and others uh, because most of the Islamic scholars trying theorizing Islam based on the text of the Quran. Uh, and the, most of them, they ignore the Islamic practice of history, like the idea of democracy and shura. Uh, why it's important here? Because if you read the book of the public freedoms in Islamic state, more theorizing about how 
freedom it's a, a great value uh, of, of islam like justice great value of islam but if you look into the main two countries now they consider themselves islamist islamic like the saudi arabia and iran they have the worst justice system in the world i this this is an, an important uh, to link the the practice with the theory i th i think this is why also back to the concept of the islamic state how and in how islam is missing a political system uh, since the beginning this is why when uh, when most of uh, ali abdul raziq or others they argue that there is no islamic state in islam because if you look after the uh, of of the death of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the transition of power was different from Abu Bakr into Omar into Osman into Ali. And there is no the same system that we can build on. I'm trying now writing a book about how the idea of the Senate, which the Senate means the Shura, was a missing in Islamic history. And back to the same idea, how theory always was different than the practice in Islamic history. And, and I think if we be able to mix those together, can we come up with a theory? It can be, uh, uh, but it always, always I appreciate the contribution of Sheikh Rashid into the idea of the public freedoms. And this is uh, because to see the state from that perspective rather than of the perspective of halal, of haram, uh, before him, most of the scholars, they see what the Islamic state they can do and what cannot do. But Rashid Ghanoushi came from different perspective. No, we, he said, no, this is not the job of the state, the job of the state to offer the freedoms of the individuals. And I think this is an, an important contribution uh, 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 to go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Radwan. Um, I think that uh, in conclusion that we've had a very, very interesting uh, discussion about this uh, this book and really this man, you know, Sheikh Rashid Ghanoushi, who is without doubt one of the main thinkers of in uh, in the Islamic world today about the question of Islamic, I mean, of Islam and democracy or freedoms uh, in Islam. So um, I'd like to conclude by saying that uh, we at CSID are committed to doing everything we can to win his release uh, as soon as possible. So please join us. Uh, by doing whatever you can in terms of writing articles, writing letters, uh, organizing events, uh, anything you can do at uh, at your level or at your uh, uh, wherever you are to help shed light on the uh, uh, the great injustice that uh, Sheikh Rashid is is going through uh, these days. Uh, please help us. Please uh, do whatever you can to. Uh, put as much pressure as possible to win his release. It's it's uh, it's a big big injustice. Um, as to um, what other Islamists and Islamic thinkers can learn from the Tunisian model, I think that in the first ten years we were all very hopeful that Tunisia would be uh, really an important lesson uh, of uh, of Islamic democracy for Muslims all over the world. But now it has failed. So I'm sure I'm not sure that uh, uh, people in the Muslim world right now are are learning a lot from that mistake because they're saying, well, you know, ultimately it failed. You know, so maybe Ranushi was too lenient. Maybe Ranushi was too uh, naive or Nahva, you know, was too naive. Maybe these ideas are just uh, not practical. Um, so right now, we, that's why we are in a crisis because if the most moderate Islamic thinker and the most moderate Islamic movement that gave the most, you know, I mean, um, tried the most to, to satisfy all the concerns of the secular parties, the secular thinkers and individuals, really uh, did a lot of compromises and did, you know, you know, unbelievable compromises to try to build this unity around the idea of democracy. If if even this failed, if even this, you know, moderate movement and moderate thinker failed and is now ending up in jail, really, what is the message, you know, to the Muslim world and to people who uh, believe in Islam and democracy? Is the message that 
the West doesn't really care about democracy in the Muslim world uh, and is, uh, you know, will end up supporting dictators and will end up supporting who's against, uh, against democracy. Uh, is is the lesson that uh, you know we are not ready for democracy that the muslims are not ready because the divide is so big i mean ultimately i remain optimistic I, ultimately i think that isis Aid is failing miserably in ruling tunisia uh, or in solving any of the problems which tunisia has a lot of them before the coup and even after the coup you know the ISIS Ayyad and one man rule or one man dictatorship has not provided the answers, has not provided the solutions that Tunisians fought. You know, they blame democracy for not being able to solve all their problems, but now they are seeing that dictatorship is worse. So ultimately, I think that's an important lesson also to learn, you know, that democracy is not a magic wand, it's not going to solve all the problems overnight, but still uh, is a much, much better alternative than than dictatorship. But so, may I just one sentence there? Yes. The Muslim world should be able to have its political experiments and fail and to learn from them and to move forward. I mean that's how democracy evolved in the West yeah. in a very long time. Yeah. West yeah. was lucky that while this was happening, there was no country coming and bombing them or doing coups within and so on and so forth. So yeah, the experiments yeah. were cut short. And yeah, and yeah. Uh, it was a great, I think, uh, experiment in Tunisia, what happened. Now it's a downslide, but people will see that this populace who comes and says, I will save you, is not an answer. And that's okay. how we learn. And we Thank should you. just keep up the good ideas, inshallah. Good and point. just to just throw in one more sentence, it's kind of a miracle in some ways that Tunisia's flawed and fragile young democracy lasted as long as it did. It lasted yeah. a decade. It yeah. made it seven years longer than any other Arab Spring attempt. And yeah. Anatha's concessions and, and leadership and thought had a lot to do with that. You know, it made mistakes for sure, right. but right. it also learned. And which lessons did it learn and which lessons didn't it learn? And what does that tell us? I think we should all be studying it. It's very relevant. Right. And, and it's also important to remember that the coup was not just an anti the coup. It was against the entire political system. Right. And it's also important to remember that it's not, it wasn't overdetermined. It wasn't inevitable. It wasn't coming from a, a single predictable sort of um, counter-revolutionary power like in Egypt or elsewhere. So, you know, with a different president or a different um you know, set of circumstances, we could have been having a different conversation about why it's remained such a success story. Right. He can't live forever. Right. Thank you, uh, everyone. Thank, uh, thank you, you all. You. Wonderful thank discussion. And, and Andrew, for the beautiful discussion and, and illuminating discussions. We will post the videos uh, online and we'll send them to you. And please help us uh, and pray for the release of, uh, of Sheikh Rashid as soon as possible. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you.